Chapter Four of the Interesting Narrative of the Life of Alouda Equiano. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Interesting Narrative of the Life of Alouda Equiano, or Gustavus Vasa, the African, written by himself, by Alouda. Equiano. Chapter Four. The author is baptized, narrowly escapes drowning, goes on an expedition to the Mediterranean, incidents he met with there, is witness to an engagement between some English and French ships, a particular account of the celebrated engagement between Admiral Boscoen and Monsignor Le Clou off Cape Logas in August 1759, dreadful explosion of a French ship. The author sails for England. His master appointed to the command of a fire ship. Meets a negro boy from whom he experiences much benevolence. Prepares for an expedition against Belle Isle. A remarkable story of a disaster which befell his ship. Arrives at Belle Isle. Operations of the landing and siege. The author's danger and distress with his manner of extricating himself. Surrender of Belle Isle. Transactions afterwards on the coast of France. Remarkable instance of kidnapping. The author returns to England. Hears a talk of peace, and expects his freedom. His ship sails for Deptford to be paid off, and when he arrives there he is suddenly seized by his master, and carried forcibly on board a West India ship and sold. It was now between two and three years since I first came to England, a great part of which I had spent at sea so that I became inured to that service, and began to consider myself as happily situated, for my master treated me always extremely well, and my attachment and gratitude to him were very great. From the various scenes I had beheld on shipboard, I soon grew a stranger to terror of every kind, and was, in that respect at least, almost an Englishman. I have often reflected with surprise that I never felt half the alarm at any of the numerous dangers I have been in, that I was filled with at the first sight of the Europeans, and at every act of theirs, even the most trifling, when I first came among them, and for some time afterwards. That fear, however, which was the effect of my ignorance, wore away as I began to know them. I could now speak English tolerably well, and I perfectly understood everything that was said. I now not only felt myself quite easy with these new countrymen, but relished their society and manners. I no longer looked upon them as spirits, but as men superior to us, and therefore I had the stronger desire to resemble them, to imbibe their spirit, and imitate their manners. I therefore embraced every occasion of improvement, and every new thing that I observed I treasured up in my memory. I had long wished to be able to read and write, and for this purpose I took every opportunity to gain instruction, but had made as yet very little progress. However, when I went to London with my master, I had soon an opportunity of improving myself, which I gladly embraced. Shortly after my arrival, he sent me to wait upon the Miss Garans, who had treated me with much kindness when I was there before, and they sent me to school. While I was attending these ladies, their servants told me I could not go to heaven unless I was baptized. This made me very uneasy, for I had now some faint idea of a future state. Accordingly, I communicated my anxiety to the eldest Miss Garin, with whom I was become a favourite, and pressed her to have me baptised, when to my great joy she told me I should. She had formerly asked my master to let me be baptised, but he had refused. However, she now insisted on it, and he being under some obligation to her brother, complied with her request. So I was baptised in St. Margaret's Church, Westminster, in February 1759, by my present name. The clergyman at the same time gave me a book, called A Guide to the Indians, written by the Bishop of Sodor and Man. On this occasion Miss Guerin did me the honour to stand as godmother, and afterwards gave me a treat. I used to attend these ladies about the town, in which service I was extremely happy, as I had thus many opportunities of seeing London, which I desired of all things. I was sometimes, however, with my master at his rendezvous house, which was at the foot of Westminster Bridge. Here I used to enjoy myself in playing about the bridge-stairs, and often in the waterman's wherries with other boys. 
On one of these occasions there was another boy with me in a weary, and we went out into the current on the river. While we were there, two more stout boys came to us in another wherry, and abusing us for taking the boat, desired me to get into the other wherry boat. Accordingly, I went to get out of the wherry I was in, but just as I had got one of my feet into the other boat, the boys shoved it off so that I fell into the Thames, and not being able to swim, I should unavoidably have been drowned, but for the assistance of some watermen who providentially came to my relief. The Namur being again got ready for sea, my master with his gang was ordered on board, and, to my no small grief, I was obliged to leave my schoolmaster, whom I liked very much, and always attended while I stayed in London, to repair on board with my master. Nor did I leave my kind patronesses, the Miss Garands, without uneasiness and regret. They often used to teach me to read, and took great pains to instruct me in the principles of religion and the knowledge of God. I therefore parted from these amiable ladies with reluctance, after receiving from them many friendly cautions how to conduct myself, and some valuable presents. When I came to Spithead I found we were destined for the Mediterranean, with a large fleet, which was now ready to put to sea. We only waited for the arrival of the Admiral, who soon came on board, and about the beginning of the spring, 1759, having weighed anchor, and got under way, sailed for the Mediterranean and in eleven days from the land's end we got to Gibraltar. While we were here I used to be often on shore, and got various fruits in great plenty and very cheap. I had frequently told several people in my excursions on shore the story of my being kidnapped with my sister, and of our being separated, as I have related before. And I had as often expressed my anxiety for her fate, and my sorrow at having never met her again. One day, when I was on shore, and mentioning these circumstances to some persons, one of them told me he knew where my sister was, and if I would accompany him, he would bring me to her. Improbable as this story was, I believed it immediately, and agreed to go with him, while my heart leaped for joy, and, indeed, he conducted me to a black young woman, who was so like my sister, that at first sight I really thought it was her. But I was quickly undeceived, and on talking to her, I found her to be of another nation. While we lay here, the Preston came in from the Levant. As soon as she arrived, my master told me I should now see my old companion Dick, who had gone in her when she sailed for Turkey. I was much rejoiced at this news, and expected every minute to embrace him, and when the captain came on board of our ship, which he did immediately after, I ran to inquire after my friend, but with inexpressible sorrow I learned from the boat's crew that the dear youth was dead and that they had brought his chest and all his other things to my master. These he afterwards gave to me, and I regarded them as a memorial of my friend, whom I loved and grieved for as a brother. While we were at Gibraltar I saw a soldier hanging by his heels at one of the moles. Footnote. He had drowned himself in endeavouring to desert. I thought this a strange sight, as I had seen a man hanged in London by his neck. At another time I saw the master of a frigate towed to shore on a grating, by several of the men of war's boats, and discharged the fleet, which I understood was a mark of disgrace for cowardice. On board the same ship there was also a sailor, hung up at the yard-arm. After lying at Gibraltar for some time we sailed up the Mediterranean, a considerable way above the Gulf of Lyon, where we were one night overtaken by a terrible gale of wind much greater than any I had ever yet experienced. The sea ran so high that, though all the guns were well housed, there was great reason to fear their getting loose. The ship rolled so much, and if they had it must have proved our destruction. After we had cruised here for a short time we came to Barcelona, a Spanish seaport, remarkable for its silk manufactures. Here the ships were all to be watered, and my master, who spoke different languages, and used often to interpret for the admiral, superintended the watering of ours. For that purpose, he and the officers of the other ships, who were on the same service, had tents pitched in the bay, and the Spanish soldiers were stationed along the shore, I suppose to see that no depredations were committed by our men. I used constantly to attend my master, and I was charmed with this place. All the time we stayed it was like a fair with the natives, who brought us fruits of all kinds, and sold them to us much cheaper than I got them in England. 
They used also to bring wine down to us in hog and sheepskins, which diverted me very much. The Spanish officers here treated our officers with great politeness and attention, and some of them, in particular, used to come often to my master's tent to visit him, where they would sometimes divert themselves by mounting me on the horses or mules, so that I could not fall, and setting them off at full gallop, my imperfect skill in horsemanship all the while affording them no small entertainment. After the ships were boarded, we returned to our old station of cruising off Toulon, for the purpose of intercepting a fleet of French men of war that lay there. One Sunday in our cruise we came off a place where there were two small French frigates lying in shore, and our admiral, thinking to take or destroy them, sent two ships in after them, the Culloden and the Conqueror. They soon came up to the Frenchmen, and I saw a smart fight here, both by sea and land, for the frigates were covered by batteries, and they played upon our ships most furiously, which they as furiously returned, and for a long time a constant firing was kept up on all sides at an amazing rate. At last one frigate sunk, but the people escaped, though not without much difficulty, and a little after some of the people left the other frigate also, which was a mere wreck. However, our ships did not venture to bring her away. They were so much annoyed from the batteries, which raked them both in going and coming. Their topmasts were shot away, and they were otherwise so much shattered that the admiral was obliged to send in many boats to tow them back to the fleet. I afterwards sailed with a man who fought in one of the French batteries during the engagement, and he told me our ships had done considerable mischief that day, on shore and in the batteries. After this we sailed for Gibraltar, and arrived there about August 1759. Here we remained with all our sails unbent, while the fleet was watering and doing other necessary things. While we were in this situation, one day the admiral, with most of the principal officers and many people of all stations being on shore, about seven o'clock in the evening we were alarmed by signals from the frigates stationed for that purpose. And in an instant there was a general cry that the French fleet was out, and just passing through the straits. The admiral immediately came on board with some other officers, and it is impossible to describe the noise, hurry, and confusion throughout the whole fleet. In bending their sails and slipping their cables, many people and ship's boats were left on shore in the bustle. We had two captains on board of our ship, who had come away in the hurry and left their ships to follow. We shewed lights from the gunwale to the main topmast head and all our lieutenants were employed amongst the fleet to tell the ships not to wait for their captains, but to put the sails to the yards, slip their cables, and follow us, and in this confusion of making ready for fighting we set out for sea in the dark after the French fleet. Here I could have exclaimed with Ajax, O Jove, O Father, if it be thy will that we must perish, we thy will obey, but let us perish by the light of day. They had got the start of us so far that we were not able to come up with them during the night, but at daylight we saw seven sail of the line of battle some miles ahead. We immediately chased them till about four o'clock in the evening, when our ships came up with them, and though we were about fifteen large ships, our gallant admiral only fought them with his own division, which consisted of seven, so that we were just ship for ship. We passed by the whole of the enemy's fleet, in order to come up at their commander, Monsieur Laclue, who was in the ocean, an eighty-four-gun ship. As we passed, they all fired on us, and at one time three of them fired together, continuing to do so for some time. Notwithstanding which, our admiral would not suffer a gun to be fired at any of them, to my astonishment, but made us lie on our bellies on the deck till we came quite close to the ocean, which was ahead of them all, when we had orders to pour the whole three tiers into her at once. The engagement now commenced with great fury on both sides. The ocean immediately returned our fire, and we continued engaged with each other for some time, during which I was frequently stunned with the thundering of the great guns, whose dreadful contents hurried many of my companions into awful eternity. At last the French line was entirely broken, and we obtained the victory, which was immediately proclaimed with loud huzzas and acclamations. We took three prizes, La Modeste of sixty-four guns, and Le Temeraire and Centaur of seventy-four guns each. The rest of the French ships took to flight with all the sail they could crowd. Our ship being very much damaged and quite disabled from pursuing the enemy, the Admiral immediately quitted her, 
and went in the broken and only boat we had left on board, the Newark, with which, and some other ships, he went after the French. The ocean, and another large French ship, called the Redoubtable, endeavouring to escape, ran ashore at Cape Logas, on the coast of Portugal, and the French admiral and some of the crew got ashore, but we, finding it impossible to get the ships off, set fire to them both. About midnight I saw the ocean blow up, with a most dreadful explosion. I never beheld a more awful scene. In less than a minute the midnight for a certain space seemed turned into day by the blaze, which was attended with a noise louder and more terrible than thunder, that seemed to rend every element around us. My station during the engagement was on the middle deck, where I was quartered with another boy to bring powder to the aftermost gun, and here I was a witness of the dreadful fate of many of my companions, who, in the twinkling of an eye, were dashed in pieces, and launched into eternity. Happily I escaped unhurt, though the shot and splinters flew thick about me during the whole fight. Towards the latter part of it my master was wounded, and I saw him carried down to the surgeon, but though I was much alarmed for him and wished to assist him, I dared not leave my post. At this station my gunmate, a partner in bringing powder for the same gun, and I ran a very great risk for more than half an hour of blowing up the ship, for when we had taken the cartridges out of the boxes, the bottoms of many of them proving rotten, the powder ran all about the deck, near the match-tub. We scarcely had water enough at the last to throw on it. We were also, from our employment, very much exposed to the enemy's shots, for we had to go through nearly the whole length of the ship to bring the powder. I expected therefore every minute to be my last, especially when I saw our men fall so thick about me. But, wishing to guard as much against the dangers as possible, at first I thought it would be safest not to go for the powder till the Frenchmen had fired their broadside, and then, while they were charging, I could go and come with my powder, but immediately afterwards I thought this caution was fruitless, and cheering myself with the reflection that there was a time allotted for me to die as well as to be born, I instantly cast off all fear or thought whatever of death, and went through the whole of my duty with alacrity, pleasing myself with the hope, if I survived the battle, of relating it and the dangers I had escaped to the dear Miss Guerin and others when I should return to London. Our ship suffered very much in this engagement, for besides the number of our killed and wounded she was almost torn to pieces, and our rigging so much shattered that our mizzenmast and mainyard, etc., hung over the side of the ship, so that we were obliged to get many carpenters and others from some of the ships of the fleet to assist in setting us in some tolerable order. And notwithstanding, it took us some time before we were completely refitted, after which we left Admiral Broderick to command, and we, with the prizes, steered for England. On the passage, and as soon as my master was something recovered of his wounds, the Admiral appointed him captain of the Etna fire ship, on which he and I left the Namur and went on board of her at sea. I liked this little ship very much. I now became the captain's steward, in which situation I was very happy, for I was extremely well treated by all on board, and I had leisure to improve myself in reading and writing. The latter I had learned a little of before I left the Namur, as there was a school on board. When we arrived at Spithead, the Etna went into Portsmouth Harbour to refit, which, being done, we returned to Spithead and joined a large fleet that was thought to be intended against the Havana. But about that time the king died. Whether that prevented the expedition I know not, but it caused our ship to be stationed at Cowes, in the Isle of Wight, till the beginning of the year sixty-one. Here I spent my time very pleasantly. I was much on shore all about this delightful island, and found the inhabitants very civil. While I was here I met with a trifling incident, which surprised me agreeably. I was one day in a field blowing to a gentleman who had a black boy about my own size. This boy, having observed me from his master's house, was transported at the sight of one of his own countrymen, and ran to meet me with utmost haste. I, not knowing what he was about, turned a little out of his way at first, but to no purpose. He soon came close to me, and caught hold of me in his arms, as if I had been his brother, though we had never seen each other before. After we had talked together for some time, he took me to his master's house, where I was treated very kindly. This benevolent boy and I were very happy in frequently seeing each other till about the month of March, 1761, when our ship had orders to fit out again for another expedition. When we got ready, we joined a very large fleet at Spithead, 
commanded by Commodore Keppel, which was destined against Belle Isle, and with a number of transport ships with troops on board, to make a descent on the place. We sailed once more in quest of fame. I longed to engage in new adventures and see fresh wonders. I had a mind on which everything uncommon made its full impression, and every event which I considered as marvellous. Every extraordinary escape or signal deliverance, either of myself or others, I looked upon to be effected by the interposition of Providence. We had not been above ten days at sea before an incident of this kind happened, which, whatever credit it may obtain from the reader, made no small impression on my mind. We had on board a gunner whose name was John Mondel, a man of very indifferent morals. This man's cabin was between the decks, exactly over where I lay abreast of the quarter-deck ladder. One night, the 20th of April, being terrified with a dream, he awoke in so great a fright that he could not rest in his bed any longer, nor even remain in his cabin, and he went upon deck about four o'clock in the morning, extremely agitated. He immediately told those on deck of the agonies of his mind, and the dream which occasioned it, in which he said he had seen many things very awful, and had been warned by St. Peter to repent, who told him time was short. This, he said, had greatly alarmed him, and he was determined to alter his life. People generally mock the fears of others when they are themselves in safety, and some of his shipmates who heard him only laughed at him. However, he made a vow that he never would drink strong liquors again, and he immediately got a light, and gave away his sea stores of liquor. After which, his agitation still continuing, he began to read the scriptures, hoping to find some relief, and soon afterwards he laid himself down again on his bed, and endeavoured to compose himself to sleep, but to no purpose his mind still continuing in a state of agony. By this time it was exactly half after seven in the morning. I was then under the half-deck at the great cabin door, and all at once I heard the people in the waist cry out most fearfully, The Lord have mercy upon us! We are all lost! The Lord have mercy upon us! Mr. Mondel, hearing the cries, immediately ran out of his cabin, and we were instantly struck by the Lynn, a forty-gun ship, Captain Clark, which nearly ran us down. This ship had just put about, and was by the wind, but had not got full headway, or we must all have perished, for the wind was brisk. However, before Mr. Mondel had got four steps from his cabin door, she struck our ship with her cutwater right in the middle of his bed and cabin, and ran it up to the combings of the quarter-deck hatchway, and above three feet below water. And in a minute there was not a bit of wood to be seen where Mr. Mondel's cabin stood, and he was so near being killed that some of the splinters tore his face. As Mr. Mondel must inevitably have perished from this accident, had he not been alarmed in the very extraordinary way I have related, I could not help regarding this as an awful interposition of providence for his preservation. The two ships for some time swinged alongside of each other, for ours being a fire-ship our grappling irons caught the lynn every way, and the yards and rigging went at an astonishing rate. Our ship was in such a shocking condition that we all thought she would instantly go down, and every one ran for their lives, and got as well as they could on board the Lynn, but our lieutenant, being the aggressor, he never quitted the ship. However, when we found she did not sink immediately, the captain came on board again, and encouraged our people to return and try to save her. Many on this came back, but some would not venture. Some of the ships in the fleet, seeing our situation, immediately sent their boats to our assistance, but it took us the whole day to save the ship with all their help. And by using every possible means, particularly frapping her together with many housers, and putting a great quantity of tallow below water where she was damaged, she was kept together. But it was well we did not meet with any gales of wind, or we must have gone to pieces, for we were in such a crazy condition that we had ships to attend us till we arrived at Belle Isle, the place of our destination, and then we had all things taken out of the ship, and she was properly repaired. This escape of Mr. Mondo, which he, as well as myself, always considered as a singular act of providence, I believe, had a great influence on his life and conduct ever afterwards. Now that I am on this subject, I beg leave to relate another instance or two, which strongly raised my belief of the particular interposition of heaven, and which might not otherwise have found a place here, from their insignificance. I belonged for a few days in the year 1758 to the Jason of fifty-four guns at Plymouth, 
and one night, when I was on board, a woman with a child at her breast fell from the upper deck down into the hold, near the keel. Everyone thought that the mother and child must be both dashed to pieces, but to our great surprise neither of them was hurt. I myself one day fell headlong from the upper deck of the Etna down the afterhold, when the ballast was out, and all who saw me fall cried out that I was killed, but I received not the least injury. And in the same ship a man fell from the masthead on the deck without being hurt. In these, and in many more instances, I thought I could plainly trace the hand of God, without whose permission a sparrow cannot fall. I began to raise my fear from man to him alone, and to call daily on his holy name with fear and reverence, and I trust he heard my supplications, and graciously condescended to answer me according to his holy word, and to implant the seeds of piety in me, even one of the meanest of his creatures. When we had refitted our ship, and all things were in readiness for attacking the place, the troops on board the transports were ordered to disembark, and my master, as a junior captain, had a share in the command of the landing. This was on the 8th of April. The French were drawn up on the shore, and had made every disposition to oppose the landing of our men, only a small part of them this day being able to effect it. Most of them, after fighting with great bravery, were cut off, and General Crawford, with a number of others, were taken prisoners. In this day's engagement we had also our lieutenant killed. On the 21st of April we renewed our efforts to land the men, while all the men of war were stationed along the shore to cover it, and fired at the French batteries and breastworks from early in the morning till about four o'clock in the evening, when our soldiers effected a safe landing. They immediately attacked the French, and, after a sharp encounter, forced them from the batteries. Before the enemy retreated they blew up several of them, lest they should fall into our hands. Our men now proceeded to besiege the citadel, and my master was ordered on shore to superintend the landing of all the materials necessary for carrying on the siege, in which service I mostly attended him. While I was there I went about to different parts of the island, and one day, particularly, my curiosity almost cost me my life. I wanted very much to see the mode of charging the mortars and letting off the shells, and for that purpose I went to an English battery that was but a very few yards from the walls of the citadel. There, indeed, I had an opportunity of completely gratifying myself in seeing the whole operation, and that not without running a very great risk, both from the English shells that burst while I was there, but likewise from those of the French. One of the largest of their shells bursted within nine or ten yards of me. There was a single rock close by, about the size of a butt, and I got instant shelter under it in time to avoid the fury of the shell. Where it burst, the earth was torn in such a manner that two or three butts might easily have gone into the hole it made, and it threw great quantities of stones and dirt to a considerable distance. Three shot were also fired at me and another boy who was along with me. One of them in particular seemed winged with red lightning and impetuous rage, for with a most dreadful sound it hissed close by me and struck a rock at a little distance, which it shattered to pieces. When I saw what perilous circumstances I was in, I attempted to return the nearest way I could find, and thereby I got between the English and the French sentinels. An English sergeant, who commanded the outpost, seeing me, and surprised how I came there, which was by stealth along the seashore, reprimanded me very severely for it, and instantly took the sentinel off his post into custody, for his negligence in suffering me to pass the lines. While I was in this situation I observed at a little distance a French horse, belonging to some islanders, which I thought I would now mount, for the greater expedition of getting off. Accordingly I took some cord which I had about me, and making a kind of bridle of it I put it round the horse's head, and the tame beast very quietly suffered me to tie him thus and mount him. As soon as I was on the horse's back I began to kick and beat him, and try every means to make him go quick, but all to very little purpose. I could not drive him out of a slow pace. While I was creeping along, still within reach of the enemy's shot, I met with a servant well mounted on an English horse. I immediately stopped, and crying told him my case, and begged of him to help me, and this he effectually did. For having a fine large whip, he began to lash my horse with it so severely that he set off full speed with me towards the sea, while I was quite unable to hold or manage him. In this manner I went along till I came to a craggy precipice. I now could not stop my horse, and my mind was filled with apprehensions 
of my deplorable fate should he go down the precipice, which he appeared fully disposed to do. I therefore thought I had better throw myself off him at once, which I did immediately with a great deal of dexterity, and fortunately escaped unhurt. As soon as I found myself at liberty, I made the best of my way for the ship, determined I would not be so foolhardy again in a hurry. We continued to besiege the citadel till June, when it surrendered. During the siege I have counted above sixty shells and carcasses in the air at once. When this place was taken I went through the citadel, and in the bomb-proofs under it which were cut in the solid rock, and I thought it a surprising place, both for strength and building, notwithstanding which our shots and shells had made amazing devastation, and ruinous heaps all around it. After the taking of this island our ships, with some others, commanded by Commodore Stanhope and the Swiftshore, went to Bass Road, where we blocked up a French fleet. Our ships were there from June till February following, and in that time I saw a great many scenes of war, and stratagems on both sides to destroy each other's fleet. Sometimes we would attack the French with some ships of the line, at other times with boats, and frequently we made prizes. Once or twice the French attacked us by throwing shells with their bomb vessels, and one day, as a French vessel was throwing shells at our ships, she broke from her springs, behind the isle of Ida Re. The tide being complicated, she came within a gunshot of the Nassau, but the Nassau could not bring a gun to bear upon her, and thereby the Frenchmen got off. We were twice attacked by their fire floats, which they chained together, and then let them float down with the tide, but each time we sent boats with grapplings and towed them safe out of the fleet. We had different commanders while we were at this place, Commodore Stanhope, Dennis, Lord Howe, etc. From hence, before the Spanish war began, our ship and the wasp sloop were sent to St. Sebastian in Spain by Commodore Stanhope, and Commodore Dennis afterwards sent our ship as a cartel to Bayonne in France. Footnote. Among others whom we brought from Bayonne, two gentlemen who had been in the West Indies, where they sold slaves, and they confessed they had made at one time a false bill of sale, and sold two Portuguese white men among a lot of slaves. After which, note, some people have it, that sometimes shortly before persons die, their ward has been seen, that is, some spirit exactly in their likeness, though they are themselves at other places at the same time. One day, while we were at Bayonne, Mr. Mondel saw one of our men, as he thought, in the gun-room, and a little after, coming to the quarter-deck, he spoke of some circumstances of this man to some of the officers. They told him that the man was then out of the ship, in one of the boats with the lieutenant, but Mr. Mondel would not believe it, and we searched the ship. When he found the man was actually out of her, and when the boat returned some time afterwards, we found the man had been drowned at the very time Mr. Mondel thought he saw him. We went in February in 1762 to Belle Isle, and there stayed till the summer when we left it and returned to Portsmouth. After our ship was fitted out again for service, in September she went to Guernsey, where I was very glad to see my old hostess, who was now a widow, and my former little charming companion, her daughter. I spent some time here very happily with them, till October, when we had orders to repair to Portsmouth. We parted from each other with a great deal of affection, and I promised to return soon and see them again, not knowing what all-powerful fate had determined for me. Our ship having arrived at Portsmouth, we went into the harbour, and remained there till the latter part of November. When we heard great talk about peace, and, to our very great joy, in the beginning of December, we had orders to go up to London with our ship to be paid off. We received this news with loud hoozes, and every other demonstration of gladness, and nothing but mirth was to be seen throughout every part of the ship. I, too, was not without my share of the general joy on this occasion. I thought now of nothing but being freed, and working for myself, and thereby getting money to enable me to get a good education, for I always had a great desire to be able at least to read and write, and while I was on shipboard I had endeavoured to improve myself in both. While I was in the Etna particularly, the captain's clerk taught me to write, and gave me a smattering of arithmetic as far as the rule of three. There was also one Daniel Queen, about forty years of age, a man very well educated, who messed with me on board this ship, and he likewise dressed and attended the captain. Fortunately this man soon became very much attached to me, 
and took very great pains to instruct me in many things. He taught me to shave and dress hair a little, and also to read in the Bible, explaining many passages to me, which I did not comprehend. I was wonderfully surprised to see the laws and rules of my country written almost exactly here, a circumstance which I believe tended to impress our manners and customs more deeply on my memory. I used to tell him of this resemblance, and many a time we have sat up the whole night together at this employment. In short, he was like a father to me, and some even used to call me after his name. They also styled me the Black Christian. Indeed, I almost loved him with the affection of a son. Many things I have denied myself that he might have them, and when I used to play at marbles or any other game, and won a few halfpence, or got any little money, which I sometimes did, for shaving any one, I used to buy him a little sugar or tobacco, as far as my stock of money would go. He used to say that he and I never should part, and that when our ship was paid off, as I was as free as himself, or any other man on board, he would instruct me in his business, by which I might gain a good livelihood. This gave me new life and spirits, and my heart burned within me, while I thought the time long till I obtained my freedom. For though my master had not promised it to me, yet, besides the assurances I had received that he had no right to detain me, he always treated me with the greatest kindness, and reposed in me an unbounded confidence. He even paid attention to my morals, and would never suffer me to deceive him or tell lies, of which he used to tell me the consequences, and that if I did so God would not love me, so that, from all this tenderness, I had never once supposed, in all my dreams of freedom, that he would think of detaining me any longer than I wished. In pursuance of our orders, we sailed from Portsmouth for the Thames, and arrived at Deptford the 10th of December, where we cast anchor just as it was high water. The ship was up about half an hour, when my master ordered the barge to be manned, and all in an instant, without having before given me the least reason to suspect anything of the matter, he forced me into the barge, saying, I was going to leave him, but he would take care I should not. I was so struck with the unexpectedness of this proceeding, that for some time I did not make a reply, only I made an offer to go for my books and chest of clothes, but he swore I should not move out of his sight, and if I did he would cut my throat, at the same time taking his hanger. I began, however, to collect myself, and plucking up courage I told him I was free, and he could not by law serve me so. But this only enraged him the more, and he continued to swear, and said he would soon let me know whether he would or not, and at that instant sprung himself into the barge from the ship, to the astonishment and sorrow of all on board. The tide, rather unluckily for me, had just turned downward, so that we quickly fell down the river along with it, till we came among some outward-bound West India men, for he was resolved to put me on board the first vessel he could get to receive me. The boat's crew, who pulled against their will, became quite faint different times, and would have gone ashore, but he would not let them. Some of them strove then to cheer me, and told me he could not sell me, and that they would stand by me, which revived me a little. And I still entertained hopes, for as they pulled along he asked some vessels to receive me, but they could not. But just as we had got a little below Gravesend, we came alongside of a ship which was going away the next tide for the West Indies. Her name was the Charming Sally, Captain James Duran, and my master went on board and agreed with him for me, and in a little time I was sent for into the cabin. When I came there, Captain Duran asked me if I knew him. I answered that I did not. Then he said, You are now my slave. I told him my master could not sell me to him, nor to anyone else. Why, said he, did not your master buy you? I confessed he did. But I have served him, said I, many years, and he has taken all my wages and prize money, for I only got one sixpence during the war. Besides this I have been baptized, and by the laws of the land no man has a right to sell me. And I added that I had heard a lawyer and others at different times tell my master so. They both then said that those people who told me so were not my friends. But I replied it was very extraordinary that other people did not know the law as well as they. Upon this Captain Durand said I talk too much English, and if I did not behave myself well and be quiet, he had a method on board to make me. I was too well convinced of his power over me to doubt what he said, 
and my former sufferings in the slave-ship presenting themselves to my mind, the recollection of them made me shudder. However, before I retired, I told them that as I could not get my right among men here, I hoped I should hereafter in heaven, and I immediately left the cabin, filled with resentment and sorrow. The only coat I had with me my master took away with him, and said if my prize-money had been ten thousand pounds, he had a right to it all, and would have taken it. I had about nine guineas, which during my long seafaring life I had scraped together from trifling perquisites and little ventures, and I hid it that instant, lest my master should take that from me likewise, still hoping that by some means or other I should make my escape to the shore. And indeed some of my old shipmates told me not to despair, for they would get me back again, and that, as soon as they could get their pay, they would immediately come to Portsmouth to me, where the ship was going. But, alas, all my hopes were baffled, and the hour of my deliverance was yet far off. My master, having soon concluded his bargain with the captain, came out of the cabin, and he and his people got into the boat and put off. I followed them with aching eyes as long as I could, and when they were out of sight I threw myself on the deck, while my heart was ready to burst with sorrow and anguish. End of chapter 4《Of the Interesting Narrative of the Life of Olauda Equiano. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Carl Manchester, 2007. The Interesting Narrative of the Life of Olauda Equiano by Olauda Equiano. Chapter 5 The Author's Reflections on His Situation Is Deceived by a Promise of Being Delivered his despair at sailing for the West Indies, arrives at Montserrat, where he is sold to Mr. King, various interesting instances of oppression, cruelty and extortion which the author saw practised upon the slaves in the West Indies during his captivity from the year 1763 to 1766. Address on it to the planters. Thus, at the moment I expected all my toils to end, I was plunged, as I supposed, in a new slavery in comparison of which all my service hitherto had been perfect freedom, and whose horrors, always present to my mind, now rushed on it with tenfold aggravation. I wept very bitterly for some time, and began to think that I must have done something to displease the Lord, for he thus punished me so severely. This filled me with painful reflections on my past conduct. I recollected that on the morning of our arrival at Deptford I had rashly sworn that as soon as we reached London, I would spend the day in rambling and sport. My conscience smote me for this unguarded expression. I felt that the Lord was able to disappoint me in all things, and immediately considered my present situation as a judgment of heaven on account of my presumption in swearing. I therefore, with contrition of heart, acknowledged my transgression to God, and poured out my soul before him with unfeigned repentance. And with earnest supplications I besought him not to abandon me in my distress, nor cast me from his mercy for ever. In a little time my grief, spent with its own violence, began to subside, and after the first confusion of my thoughts was over, I reflected with more calmness on my present condition. I considered that trials and disappointments are sometimes for our good, and I thought God might perhaps have permitted this in order to teach me wisdom and resignation. For he had hitherto shadowed me with the wings of his mercy, and by his invisible but powerful hand brought me the way I knew not. These reflections gave me a little comfort, and I rose at last from the deck with dejection and sorrow in my countenance, yet mixed with some faint hope that the Lord would appear for my deliverance. Soon afterwards, as my new master was going ashore, he called me to him, and told me to behave myself well, and do the business of the ship the same as any of the rest of the boys, and that I should fare the better for it, but I made him no answer. I was then asked if I could swim, and I said no. However, I was made to go under the deck, and was well watched. The next tide the ship got under way, and soon after arrived at the mother bank, Portsmouth, where she waited for a few days for some of the West India convoy. While I was here, I tried every means I could devise amongst the people of the ship to get me a boat from the shore, as there was none suffered to come alongside of the ship, and their own, whenever it was used, was hoisted in again immediately. 
A sailor on board took a guinea from me on pretence of getting me a boat, and promised me, time after time, that it was hourly to come off. When he had the watch upon deck, I watched also, and looked long enough, but all in vain. I could never see either the boat or my guinea again. And what I thought was still the worst of all, the fellow gave information, as I afterwards found, all the while to the mates, of my intention to go off, if I could in any way do it, but, rogue-like, he never told them he had got a guinea from me to procure my escape. However, after we had sailed, and his trick was made known to the ship's crew, I had some satisfaction in seeing him detested and despised by them all for his behaviour to me. I was still in hopes that my old shipmates would not forget their promise to come for me to Portsmouth, and indeed, at last, but not till the day before we sailed, some of them did come there, and sent me off some oranges and other tokens of their regard. They also sent me word they would come off to me themselves the next day or the day after, and a lady also, who lived in Gosport, wrote to me that she would come and take me out of the ship at the same time. This lady had been once very intimate with my former master. I used to sell and take care of a great deal of property for her in different ships, and in return she always showed great friendship for me, and used to tell my master that she would take me away to live with her, but unfortunately for me a disagreement soon afterwards took place between them, and she was succeeded in my master's good graces by another lady, who appeared sole mistress of the Etna, and mostly lodged on board. I was not so great a favourite with this lady as with the former. She had conceived a pique against me on some occasion when she was on board, and she did not fail to instigate my master to treat me in the manner he did. Footnote. Thus was I sacrificed to the envy and resentment of this woman, for knowing that the lady whom she had succeeded in my master's good graces designed to take me into her service, which, had I once got on shore, she would not have been able to prevent. She felt her pride alarmed at the superiority of her rival in being attended by a black servant. It was not less to prevent this than to be revenged on me, that she caused the captain to treat me thus cruelly. End footnote. However, the next morning, the 30th of December, the wind being brisk and easterly, the Oailus frigate, which was to escort the convoy, made a signal for sailing. All the ships then got up their anchors, and, before any of my friends had an opportunity to come off to my relief, to my inexpressible anguish, our ship had got under way. What tumultuous emotions agitated my soul when the convoy got under sail, and I a prisoner on board, now without hope! I kept my swimming eyes upon the land in a state of unutterable grief, not knowing what to do, and despairing how to help myself. While my mind was in this situation, the fleet sailed on, and in one day's time I lost sight of the wished-for land. In the first expressions of my grief I reproached my fate, and wished I had never been born. I was ready to curse the tide that bore us, the gale that wafted my prison, and even the ship that conducted us, and I called on death to relieve me from the horrors I felt and dreaded, that I might be in that place, quote, where slaves are free and men oppress no more. Fool that I was, inured so long to pain, to trust to hope or dream of joy again, now dragged once more beyond the western main, to groan beneath some dastard planter's chain, where my poor countrymen in bondage wait the long enfranchisement of lingering fate, hard lingering fate, while ere the dawn of day, roused by the lash, they go their cheerless way, and as their souls with shame and anguish burn, salute with groans and welcome morn's return, and chiding every hour the slow-paced sun, pursue their toils till all his race is run. No eye to mark their sufferings with a tear, no friend to comfort, and no hope to cheer. Then, like the dull unpitied brutes repair, to stalls as wretched, and as coarse a fare. Thank heaven one day of misery was o'er, then sink to sleep, and wish to wake no more. End quote. Footnote. The Dying Negro, a poem originally published in 1773. Perhaps it may not be deemed impertinent here to add, that this elegant and pathetic little poem was occasioned, as appears by the advertisement prefixed to it, by the following incident. Quote, a black, who a few days before had ran away from his master, and got himself christened, 
with intent to marry a white woman, his fellow servant, being taken and sent on board a ship in the Thames, took an opportunity of shooting himself through the head. End quote. End footnote. The turbulence of my emotions, however naturally, gave way to calmer thoughts, and I soon perceived what fate had decreed no mortal on earth could prevent. The convoy sailed on without any accident, with a pleasant gale and smooth sea, for six weeks till February, when one morning the Oeolus ran down a brig, one of the convoy, and she instantly went down and was engulfed in the dark recesses of the ocean. The convoy was immediately thrown into great confusion till it was daylight, and the Oeolus was illumined with lights to prevent any farther mischief. On the 13th of February, 1763, from the masthead, we descried our destined island Montserrat, and soon after I beheld those, quote, regions of sorrow, doleful shades, where peace and rest can rarely dwell. Hope never comes that comes to all, but torture without end still urges. End quote. At the sight of this land of bondage, a fresh horror ran through all my frame, and chilled me to the heart. My former slavery now rose in dreadful review to my mind, and displayed nothing but misery, stripes, and chains, and in the first paroxysm of my grief I called upon God's thunder and his avenging power to direct the stroke of death to me, rather than permit me to become a slave and be sold from lord to lord. In this state of my mind our ship came to an anchor, and soon after discharged her cargo. I now knew what it was to work hard, and I was made to help to unload and load the ship and to comfort me in my distress in that time, two of the sailors robbed me of all my money, and ran away from the ship. I had been so long used to an European climate, that at first I felt the scorching West India sun very painfully, while the dashing surf would toss the boat and the people in it frequently above high water mark. Sometimes our limbs were broken with this, or even attended with instant death, and I was day by day mangled and torn. About the middle of May, when the ship had got ready to sail for England, I, all the time believing that fate's blackest clouds were gathering over my head, and expecting their bursting would mix me with the dead, Captain Doran sent for me ashore one morning, and I was told by the messenger that my fate was then determined. With fluttering steps and trembling heart I came to the captain, and found him with one Mr. Robert King, a Quaker, and the first merchant in the place. The captain then told me my former master had sent me there to be sold, but that he had desired him to get me the best master he could, as he told him I was a very deserving boy, which Captain Doran said he found to be true, and if he were to stay in the West Indies he would be glad to keep me himself, but he could not venture to take me to London, for he was very sure that when I came there I would leave him. I at that instant burst out a-crying, and begged much of him to take me to England with him but all to no purpose. He told me that he had got the very best master in the whole island, with whom I should be as happy as if I were in England, and for that reason he chose to let him have me, though he could sell me to his own brother-in-law for a great deal more money than he got from this gentleman. Mr. King, my new master, then made a reply, and said the reason he had bought me was on account of my good character, and, as he had not the least doubt of my good behaviour, I should be very well off with him. He also told me he did not live in the West Indies, but at Philadelphia, where he was going soon, and, as I understood something of the rules of arithmetic, when we got there he would put me to school, and fit me for a clerk. This conversation relieved my mind a little, and I left those gentlemen considerably more at ease in myself than when I came to them, and I was very grateful to Captain Doran, and even to my old master, for the character they had given me a character which I afterwards found of infinite service to me. I went on board again, and took leave of all my shipmates, and the next day the ship sailed. When she weighed anchor, I went to the waterside, and looked at her with a very wishful and aching heart, and followed her with my eyes and tears, until she was totally out of sight. I was so bowed down with grief, that I could not hold up my head for many months, and if my new master had not been kind to me, I believe I should have died under it at last. And indeed I soon found that he fully deserved the good character which Captain Doran had given me of him, for he possessed a most amiable disposition and temper, 
and was very charitable and humane. If any of his slaves behaved amiss, he did not beat or use them ill, but parted with them. This made them afraid of disobliging him, and as he treated his slaves better than any other man on the island, so he was better and more faithfully served by them in return. By his kind treatment, I did at last endeavour to compose myself, and with fortitude, though moneyless, determined to face whatever fate had decreed for me. Mr. King soon asked me what I could do, and at the same time said he did not mean to treat me as a common slave. I told him I knew something of seamanship, and could shave and dress hair pretty well, and I could refine wines, which I had learnt on shipboard, where I had often done it, and that I could write, and understood arithmetic tolerably well, as far as the rule of three. He then asked me if I knew anything of gauging, and on my answering that I did not, he said one of his clerks should teach me to gauge. Mr. King dealt in all manner of merchandise, and kept from one to six clerks. He loaded many vessels in a year, particularly to Philadelphia where he was born, and was connected with a great mercantile house in that city. He had besides many vessels and droggers, of different sizes, which used to go about the island, and others to collect rum, sugar, and other goods. I understood pulling and managing those boats very well, and this hard work, which was the first that he set me to, in the sugar seasons used to be my constant employment. I have rowed the boat, and slaved at the oars, from one hour to sixteen in the twenty-four, during which I had fifteen pence sterling per day to live on, though sometimes only ten pence. However, this was considerably more than was allowed to other slaves that used to work with me, and belonged to other gentlemen on the island. Those poor souls had never more than nine pence per day, and seldom more than six pence from their masters or owners, though they earned them three or four pistarines. Footnote. These pistarines are of the value of a shilling. End footnote. For it is a common practice in the West Indies for men to purchase slaves, though they have no plantations themselves, in order to let them out to planters and merchants at so much a piece by the day, and they give them what allowance they choose out of this produce of their daily work to the slaves for subsistence. This allowance is often very scanty. My master often gave the owners of these slaves two and a half of these pieces per day, and found the poor fellows in victuals himself, because he thought their owners did not feed them well enough according to the work they did. The slaves used to like this very well, and as they knew my master was a man of feeling, they were always glad to work for him in preference to any other gentleman, some of whom, after they had been paid for these poor people's labours, would not give them their allowance out of it. Many times I have seen these unfortunate wretches beaten for asking for their pay, and often severely flogged by their owners, if they did not bring them their daily or weekly money exactly to the time, though the poor creatures were obliged to wait on the gentlemen they had worked for, sometimes for more than half the day before they could get their pay, and this generally on Sundays, when they wanted the time for themselves. In particular, I knew a countryman of mine, who once did not bring the weekly money directly that it was earned, and though he brought it the same day to his master, yet he was staked to the ground for his pretended negligence, and who was just going to receive a hundred lashes, but for a gentleman who begged him off fifty. This poor man was very industrious, and by his frugality had saved so much money by working on shipboard, that he had got a white man to buy him a boat, unknown to his master. Some time after he had this little estate, the governor wanted a boat to bring his sugar from different parts of the island, and knowing this to be a negro man's boat, he seized upon it for himself, and would not pay the owner a farthing. The man on this went to his master, and complained to him of this act of the governor, but the only satisfaction he received was to be damned very heartily by his master, who asked him how dared any of his negroes to have a boat. If the justly merited ruin of the governor's fortune could be any gratification to the poor man he had thus robbed, he was not without consolation. Extortion and rapine are poor providers, and some time after this the governor died in the king's bench in England, and I was told in great poverty. The last war favoured this poor negro man, and he found some means to escape from his Christian master. He came to England, where I saw him afterwards several times. Such treatment as this often drives these miserable wretches to despair, and they run away from their masters at the hazard of their lives. 
many of them, in this place, unable to get their pay when they have earned it, and fearing to be flogged as usual, if they return home without it, run away where they can for shelter, and a reward is often offered to bring them in, dead or alive. My master used sometimes, in these cases, to agree with their owners, and to settle with them himself, and thereby he saved many of them a flogging. Once, for a few days, I was let out to fit a vessel, and I had no victuals allowed me by either party. At last I told my master of this treatment, and he took me away from it. In many of the estates, on the different islands where I used to be sent for rum or sugar, they would not deliver it to me, or any other negro. He was therefore obliged to send a white man along with me to those places, and then he used to pay him from six to ten pisterines a day. From being thus employed during the time I served Mr. King in going about the different estates on the island, I had all the opportunity I could wish for to see the dreadful usage of the poor men, usage that reconciled me to my situation, and made me bless God for the hands into which I had fallen. I had the good fortune to please my master in every department in which he employed me, and there was scarcely any part of his business or household affairs in which I was not occasionally engaged. I often supplied the place of a clerk in receiving and delivering cargoes to the ships, intending stores and delivering goods, and besides this I used to shave and dress my master when convenient and take care of his horse, and when it was necessary, which was very often, I worked likewise on board of different vessels of his. By these means I became very useful to my master, and saved him, as he used to acknowledge, above a hundred pounds a year. Nor did he scruple to say I was of more advantage to him than any of his clerks, though their usual wages in the West Indies are from sixty to a hundred pounds current a year. I have sometimes heard it asserted that a negro cannot earn his master the first cost, but nothing can be further from the truth. I suppose nine-tenths of the mechanics throughout the West Indies are negro slaves, and I well know the coopers among them can earn two dollars a day, the carpenters the same, and oftentimes more, as also the masons, smiths, and fishermen, etc., and I have known many slaves whose masters would not take a thousand pounds current for them. But surely this assertion refutes itself, for if it be true, why do the planters and merchants pay such a price for a slave, and above all, why do those who make this assertion exclaim the most loudly against the abolition of the slave trade? So much are men blinded, and to such inconsistent arguments are they driven by mistaken interest. I grant, indeed, that slaves are sometimes, by half-feeding, half-clothing, overworking, and stripes, reduced so low that they are turned out as unfit for service, and left to perish in the woods, or expire on a dunghill. My master was several times offered by different gentlemen one hundred guineas for me, but he always told them that he would not sell me, to my great joy, and I used to double my diligence and care for fear of getting into the hands of those men who did not allow a valuable slave the common support of life. Many of them even used to find fault with my master for feeding his slave so well as he did, although I often went hungry, and an Englishman might think my fare very indifferent but he used to tell them he always would do it, because the slaves thereby looked better and did more work. While I was thus employed by my master, I was often a witness to cruelties of every kind which were exercised on my unhappy fellow-slaves. I used frequently to have different cargoes of new negroes in my care for sale, and it was almost a constant practice with our clerks and other whites to commit violent depredations on the chastity of the female slaves, and these I was, though with reluctance, obliged to submit to at all times, being unable to help them. When we have had some of these slaves on board my master's vessel, to carry them to other islands, or to America, I have known our mates to commit these acts most shamefully, to the disgrace, not of Christians only, but of men. I have even known them gratify their brutal passion with females not ten years old, and these abominations some of them practised to such scandalous excess that one of our captains discharged the mate and others on that account. And yet in Montserrat I have seen a negro man staked to the ground, and cut most shockingly, and then his ears cut off bit by bit, because he had been connected with a white woman who was a common prostitute, 
as if it were no crime in the whites to rob an innocent African girl of her virtue, but most heinous in a black man only to gratify a passion of nature, where the temptation was offered by one of a different colour, though the most abandoned woman of her species. Another negro man was half hanged and then burnt for attempting to poison a cruel overseer. Thus, by repeated cruelties, are the wretched first urged to despair, and then murdered, because they still retain so much of human nature about them as to wish to put an end to their misery and retaliate on their tyrants. These overseers are indeed for the most part persons of the worst character of any denomination of men in the West Indies. Unfortunately, many humane gentlemen, by not residing on their estates, are obliged to leave the management of them in the hands of these human butchers, who cut and mangle the slaves in a shocking manner on the most trifling occasions, and altogether treat them in every respect like brutes. They pay no regard to the situation of pregnant women, nor the least attention to the lodging of the field negroes. Their huts, which ought to be well covered, and the place dry where they take their repose, are often open sheds, built in damp places, so that, when the poor creatures return tired from the toils of the field, they contract many disorders from being exposed to the damp air in this uncomfortable state, while they are heated and their pores are open. This neglect certainly conspires with many others to cause a decrease in the births as well as in the lives of the grown negroes. I can quote many instances of gentlemen who reside on their estates in the West Indies, and then the scene is quite changed. The negroes are treated with lenity and proper care, by which their lives are prolonged and their masters are profited. To the honour of humanity, I knew several gentlemen who managed their estates in this manner, and they found that benevolence was their truest interest. And, among many I could mention in several of the islands, I knew one in Montserrat, footnote, Mr. Dewberry, and many others, Montserrat, end footnote, whose slaves looked remarkably well, and never needed any fresh supplies of negroes, and there are many other estates, especially in Barbados, which, from such judicious treatment, need no fresh stock of negroes at any time. I have the honour of knowing a most worthy and humane gentleman who is a native of Barbados, and has estates there. Footnote. Sir Philip Gibbs, Baronet, Barbados. End footnote. This gentleman has written a treatise on the usage of his own slaves. He allows them two hours for refreshment at midday, and many other indulgences and comforts, particularly in their lying, and besides this, he raises more provisions on his estate than they can destroy, so that by these attentions he saves the lives of his negroes, and keeps them healthy and as happy as the condition of slavery can admit. I myself, as shall appear in the sequel, managed an estate where, by those attentions, the negroes were uncommonly cheerful and healthy, and did more work by half than by the common mode of treatment they usually do. For want, therefore, of such care and attention to the poor negroes, and otherwise oppressed as they are, it is no wonder that the decrease should require twenty thousand new negroes annually to fill up the vacant places of the dead. Even in Barbados, notwithstanding those humane exceptions which I have mentioned, and others I am acquainted with, which justly make it quoted as a place where slaves meet with the best treatment, and need fewest recruits of any in the West Indies, yet this island requires a thousand negroes annually to keep up the original stock, which is only eighty thousand, so that the whole term of a negro's life may be said to be there but sixteen years. Footnote. Benazay's Account of Guinea. Page 16. End footnote. And yet the climate here is in every respect the same as that from which they are taken, except in being more wholesome. Do the British colonies decrease in this manner? And yet what a prodigious difference is there between an English and a West India climate. While I was in Montserrat, I knew a Negro man named Emmanuel Sankey, who endeavoured to escape from his miserable bondage by concealing himself on board of a London ship. But fate did not favour the poor oppressed man, for being discovered when the vessel was under sail, he was delivered up again to his master. This Christian master immediately pinned the wretch down to the ground at each wrist and ankle, and then took some sticks of sealing wax and lighted them, and dropped it all over his back. There was another master who was noted for cruelty, 
and I believe he had not a slave but what had been cut, and had pieces fairly taken out of the flesh, and after they had been punished thus, he used to make them get into a long wooden box or case he had for that purpose, in which he shut them up during pleasure. It was just about the height and breadth of a man, and the poor wretches had no room, when in the case, to move. It was very common in several of the islands, particularly in St. Kitts, for the slaves to be branded with the initial letters of their master's name, and a load of heavy iron hooks hung about their necks. Indeed, on the most trifling occasions they were loaded with chains, and often instruments of torture were added. The iron muzzle, thumb screws, etc., are so well known as not to need a description, and were sometimes applied for the slightest faults. I have seen a negro beaten till some of his bones were broken, for even letting a pot boil over. Is it surprising that usage like this should drive the poor creatures to despair, and make them seek a refuge in death from those evils which render their lives intolerable, while, quote, with shuddering horror pale and eyes aghast, they view their lamentable lot and find no rest? End quote. This they frequently do. A negro man on board a vessel of my master, while I belonged to her, having been put in irons for some trifling misdemeanour, and kept in that state for some days, being wary of life, took an opportunity of jumping overboard into the sea. However, he was picked up without being drowned. Another, whose life was also a burden to him, resolved to starve himself to death, and refused to eat any victuals. This procured him a severe flogging, and he also, on the first occasion which offered, jumped overboard at Charlestown, but was saved. Nor is there any greater regard shown to the little property than there is to the persons and lives of the negroes. I have already related an instance or two of particular oppression, out of many which I have witnessed, but the following is frequent in all the islands. The wretched field slaves, after toiling all the day for an unfeeling owner who gives them but little victuals, steal sometimes a few moments from rest or refreshment to gather some small portion of grass according as their time will admit. This they commonly tie up in a parcel, either a bit worth sixpence or half a bit's worth, and bring it to town or to the market to sell. Nothing is more common than for the white people on this occasion to take the grass from them without paying for it, and not only so, but too often also, to my knowledge, our clerks and many others at the same time have committed acts of violence on the poor, wretched and helpless females, whom I have seen for hours standing crying to no purpose, and get no redress or pay of any kind. Is not this one common and crying sin enough to bring down God's judgment on the islands? He tells us the oppressor and the oppressed are both in his hands, and if these are not the poor, the broken-hearted, the blind, the captive, the bruised, which our Saviour speaks of, who are they? One of these depredators once, in St. Eustatia, came on board of our vessel, and bought some fowls and pigs of me, and a whole day after his departure, with the things he returned again, and wanted his money back. I refused to give it, and, not seeing my captain on board, he began the common pranks with me, and swore he would even break open my chest and take my money. I therefore expected, as my captain was absent, that he would be as good as his word, and he was just proceeding to strike me, when fortunately a British seaman on board, whose heart had not been debauched by a West India climate, interposed and prevented him. But had the cruel man struck me, I certainly should have defended myself at the hazard of my life, for what is life to a man thus oppressed? He went away, however, swearing, and threatened that whenever he caught me on shore he would shoot me, and pay for me afterwards. The small account in which the life of a negro is held in the West Indies is so universally known that it might seem impertinent to quote the following extract, if some people had not been hardy enough of late to assert that negroes are on the same footing in that respect as Europeans. By the 329th Act, page 125 of the Assembly of Barbados, it is enacted, quote, that if any negro or other slave, under punishment by his master, or his order, for running away, or any other crime or misdemeanour towards his said master, unfortunately shall suffer in life or member, no person whatsoever shall be liable to a fine. 
but if any man shall out of wantonness or only of bloody mindedness or cruel intention wilfully kill a negro or other slave of his own he shall pay into the public treasury fifteen pounds sterling end quote. and it is the same in most if not all of the west india islands is not this one of the many acts of the islands which call loudly for redress and do not the assembly which enacted it deserve the appellation of savages and brutes rather than of christians and men it is an act at once unmerciful, unjust, and unwise, which for cruelty would disgrace an assembly of those who are called barbarians, and for its injustice and insanity would shock the morality and common sense of a Samade or a Hottentot. Shocking as this and many more acts of the bloody West India Code at first view appear, how is the iniquity of it heightened when we consider to whom it may be extended? Mr. James Tobin, a zealous labourer in the vineyard of slavery, gives an account of a French planter of his acquaintance in the island of Martinico, who showed him many mulattoes working in the fields like beasts of burden, and he told Mr. Tobin that these were all the produce of his own loins. And I myself have known similar instances. Pray, reader, are these sons and daughters of the French planter less his children by being begotten of a black woman? and what must be the virtue of those legislators and the feelings of those fathers who estimate the lives of their sons however begotten at no more than fifteen pounds though they should be murdered as the act says out of wantonness and bloody mindedness but is not the slave trade entirely a war with the heart of man and surely that which is begun by breaking down the barriers of virtue involves in its continuance destruction to every principle and buries all sentiments in ruin. I have often seen slaves, particularly those who were meagre, in different islands, put into scales and weighed, and then sold from three pence to six pence or nine pence a pound. My master, however, whose humanity was shocked at this mode, used to sell such by the lump. And at or after a sale, it was not uncommon to see negroes taken from their wives wives taken from their husbands and children from their parents and sent off to other islands and wherever else their merciless lords chose and probably never more during life to see each other oftentimes my heart has bled at these partings when the friends of the departed have been at the waterside and with sighs and tears have kept their eyes fixed on the vessel till it went out of sight a poor creole negro i knew well who after having been often thus transported from island to island at last resided in montserrat this man used to tell me many melancholy tales of himself generally after he had done working for his master he used to employ his few leisure moments to go a-fishing when he had caught any fish his master would frequently take them from him without paying him and at other times some other white people would serve him in the same manner one day he said to me very movingly sometimes when a white man take away my fish i go to my massa and he get me my right and when my massa by strength take away my fishes what me must do i can't go to anybody to be righted then said the poor man looking up above i must look up to god mighty in the top for right this artless tale moved me much and i could not help feeling the just cause moses had in redressing his brother against the egyptian i exhorted the man to look up still to the god on the top since there was no redress below though i little thought then that i myself should more than once experience such imposition and read the same exhortation hereafter in my own transactions in the islands and that even this poor man and i should some time after suffer together in the same manner as shall be related hereafter nor was such usage of this confined to particular places or individuals for in all the different islands in which i had been and i have visited no less than fifteen the treatment of the slaves was nearly the same so nearly indeed that the history of an island or even a plantation with a few such exceptions as i have mentioned might serve for a history of the whole such a tendency has the slave trade to debauch men's minds and hardened them to every feeling of humanity. For I will not suppose that the dealers in slaves are born worse than other men. No, it is the fatality of this mistaken avarice, 
that it corrupts the milk of human kindness and turns into gall. And had the pursuits of those men been different, they might have been as generous, as tender-hearted and just, as they are unfeeling, rapacious and cruel. Surely this traffic cannot be good, which spreads like a pestilence and taints what it touches, which violates that first natural right of mankind, equality and independency, and gives one man a dominion over his fellows, which God could never intend. For it raises the owner to a state as far above man as it depresses the slave below it, and, with all the presumption of human pride, sets a distinction between them, immeasurable in extent and endless in duration. Yet how mistaken is the avarice even of the planters! Are slaves more useful by being thus humbled to the condition of brutes than they would be if suffered to enjoy the privileges of men? The freedom which diffuses health and prosperity throughout Britain answers you, no. When you make men slaves, you deprive them of half their virtue. You set them in your own conduct an example of fraud, rapine and cruelty, and compel them to live with you in a state of war and yet you complain that they are not honest or faithful. You stupefy them with stripes, and think it necessary to keep them in a state of ignorance, and yet you assert that they are incapable of learning, that their minds are such a barren soil or more that culture would be lost on them, and that they come from a climate where nature, though prodigal of her bounties in a degree unknown to yourselves, has left man alone scant and unfinished, and incapable of enjoying the treasures she has poured out of him, an assertion at once impious and absurd. Why do you use those instruments of torture? Are they fit to be applied by one rational being to another, and are ye not struck with shame and mortification to see the partakers of your nature reduced so low? But above all, are there no dangers attending this mode of treatment? Are you not hourly in dread of an insurrection? nor would it be surprising for when quote, no peace is given to us enslaved but custody severe and stripes and arbitrary punishment inflicted what peace can we return but to our power hostility and hate untamed reluctance and revenge though slow yet ever plotting how the conqueror least may reap his conquest and may least rejoice in doing what we most in suffering feel End quote but by changing your conduct and treating your slaves as men, every cause of fear would be banished. They would be faithful, honest, intelligent and vigorous, and peace, prosperity and happiness would attend you. End of chapter 5「Chapter Six of the Interesting Narrative of the Life of Olauda Equiano. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Catherine Fitz. Chapter Six of the Interesting Narrative of the Life of Olauda Equiano by Alauda Equiano. Chapter 6. Some Account of Brimstone Hill in Montserrat. Favorable Change in the Author's Situation. He Commences Merchant with Threepence. His Various Success in Dealing in the Different Islands and America, and the Impositions he Meets with in his Transactions with Europeans. A Curious Imposition on Human Nature. Danger of the Serfs in West Indies. Remarkable instance of kidnapping a free mulatto. The author is nearly murdered by a Dr. Perkins in Savannah. In the preceding chapter, I have set before the reader a few of those many instances of oppression, extortion, and cruelty which I have been a witness to in the West Indies. But, were I to enumerate them all, the catalogue would be tedious and disgusting. The punishments of the slaves on every trifling occasion are so frequent and so well known, together with the different instruments with which they are tortured, that it cannot any longer afford novelty to recite them, and they are too shocking to yield delight either to the writer or to the reader. 
I shall therefore hereafter only mention such as incidentally befell myself in the course of my adventures. In the variety of departments in which I was employed by my master, I had an opportunity of seeing many curious scenes in different islands, but above all I was struck with a celebrated curiosity called Brimstone Hill, which is a high and steep mountain some few miles from the town of Plymouth in Montserrat. I had often heard of some wonders that were to be seen on this hill, and I went once with some white and black people to visit it. When we arrived at the top, I saw under different cliffs great flakes of brimstone, occasioned by the steams of various little ponds, which were then boiling naturally in the earth. Some of these ponds were white as milk, some quite blue, and many others of different colors. I had taken some potatoes with me, and I put them into different ponds. In a few minutes they were well boiled. I tasted some of them, but they were very sulfurous. The silver shoe-buckles, and all the other things of metal that we had among us, were, in a little time, turned as black as lead. Sometime in the year 1763 kind providence seemed to appear rather more favorable to me. One of my master's vessels, a Bermuda sloop, about sixty tons, was commanded by one Captain Thomas Farmer, an Englishman, a very alert and active man, who gained my master a great deal of money by his good management in carrying passengers from one island to another. But very often his sailors used to get drunk and run away from the vessel, which hindered him in his business very much. This man had taken a liking to me, and many different times begged of my master to let me go on a trip with him as a sailor, but he would tell him he could not spare me. Though the vessel sometimes could not go for want of hands, for sailors were generally very scarce in the island. However, at last, from necessity or force, my master was prevailed on, though very reluctantly, to let me go with this captain. But he gave great charge to him to take care that I did not run away, for if I did he would make him pay for me. This being the case, the captain had for some time a sharp eye upon me whenever the vessel anchored, and as soon as she returned I was sent for on shore again. Thus I was slaving as if it were for life, sometimes at one thing, sometimes at another, so that the captain and I were nearly the most useful men in my master's employment. I also became so useful to the captain on shipboard, that many times, when he used to ask for me to go with him, though it should be but for twenty-four hours to some of the islands near us, my master would answer he could not spare me, at which the captain would swear, and would not go on the trip, and tell my master that I was better to him on board than any three white men he had for they used to behave ill in many respects, particularly in getting drunk, and then they frequently got the boat-stove, so as to hinder the vessel from coming back as soon as she might have done. This my master knew very well, and at last, by the captain's constant entreaties, after I had been several times with him, one day, to my great joy, my master told me the captain would not let him rest, and asked me whether I would go aboard as a sailor, or stay on shore and mind the stores for he could not bear any longer to be plagued in this manner. I was very happy at this proposal, for I immediately thought I might in time stand some chance by being on board to get a little money, or possibly make my escape if I should be ill-used. I also expected to get better food, and in greater abundance, for I had felt much hunger oftentimes, though my master treated his slaves, as I have observed, uncommonly well. I therefore, without hesitation, answered him that I would go and be a sailor if he pleased. Accordingly, I was ordered on board directly. Nevertheless, between the vessel and the shore, when she was in port, I had little or no rest, as my master always wished to have me along with him. Indeed, he was a very pleasant gentleman, and but for my expectations on shipboard I should not have thought of leaving him. But the captain liked me also very much, and I was entirely his right-hand man. I did all I could to deserve his favor, and in return I received better treatment from him than any other I believe ever met with in the West Indies in my situation. After I had been sailing for some time with this captain, at length I endeavored to try my luck and commence merchant. I had but a very small capital to begin with, for one single half-bit, which is equal to three pence in England, made up my whole stock. However, I trusted to the Lord to be with me, and at one of our trips to St. Eustatia, a Dutch island, 
I bought a glass tumbler with my half bit, and when I came to Montserrat I sold it for a bit, or sixpence. Luckily we made several successive trips to St. Eustatia, which was a general mart for the West Indies, about twenty leagues from Montserrat. And in our next, finding my tumbler so profitable, with this one bit I bought two tumblers more, and when I came back I sold them for two bits, equal to a shilling sterling. When we went again I bought with these two bits four more of these glasses, which I sold for four bits on our return to Montserrat, and in our next voyage to St. Eustatia I bought two glasses with one bit, and with the other three I bought a jug of Geneva, nearly about three pints in measure. When we came to Montserrat I sold the gin for eight bits, and the tumblers for two, so that my capital now amounted in all to a dollar, well husbanded, and acquired in the space of a month or six weeks, when I blessed the Lord that I was so rich. As we sailed to different islands, I laid this money out in various things occasionally, and it used to turn out very good account, especially when we went to Guadalupe, Granada, and the rest of the French islands. Thus I was going all about the islands upwards of four years, ever trading as I went, during which I experienced many instances of ill usage, and have seen many injuries done to other negroes in our dealings with Europeans. And amidst our recreations, when we have been dancing and merry-making, they without cause have molested and insulted us. Indeed, I was more than once obliged to look up to God on high, as I had advised the poor fishermen some time before. And I had not long been trading for myself in the manner I have related above, when I experienced the like trial in company with him, as follows. This man being used to the water, was upon an emergency put on board of us by his master to work as another hand, on a voyage to Santa Cruz. And at our sailing, he brought his little all for a venture, which consisted of six bits worth of limes and oranges in a bag. I had also my whole stock, which was about twelve bits worth of the same kind of goods, separate in two bags, for we had heard these fruits sold very well in that island. When we came there, in some little convenient time, he and I went ashore with our fruits to sell them. But we had scarcely landed when we were met by two white men, who presently took our three bags from us. We could not at first guess what they meant to do, and for some time we thought they were jesting with us, but they too soon let us know otherwise, for they took our ventures immediately to a house hard by and adjoining the fort, while we followed all the way begging them to give us our fruits, but in vain. They not only refused to return them, but swore at us, and threatened that if we did not immediately depart they would flog us well. We told them these three bags were all we were worth in the world, and that we brought them with us to sell when we came from Montserrat, and shewed them the vessel. But this was rather against us, as they now saw we were strangers as well as slaves. They still therefore swore, and desired us to be gone, and even took sticks to beat us, while we, seeing they meant what they said, went off in the greatest confusion and despair. Thus. In the very minute of gaining more by three times than I ever did by any venture in my life before, was I deprived of every farthing I was worth. An insupportable misfortune, but how to help ourselves we knew not. In our consternation we went to the commanding officer of the fort, and told them how we had been served by some of his people. But we obtained not the least redress. He answered our complaints only by a volley of imprecations against us and immediately took a horse-whip, in order to chastise us, so that we were obliged to turn out much faster than we came in. I now, in the agony of distress and indignation, wished that the ire of God in his forked lightning might transfix these cruel oppressors among the dead. Still, however, we persevered, went back again to the house, and begged and besought them again and again for our fruits, till at last some other people that were in the house asked if we would be contented if they kept one bag, and gave us the other two. We, seeing no remedy whatever, consented to this. And they, observing one bag to have both kinds of fruit in it, which belonged to my companion, kept that, and the other two, which were mine, they gave us back. As soon as I got them, 
I ran as fast as I could, and got the first negro man I could to help me off. My companion, however, stayed a little longer to plead. He told them the bag they had was his, and likewise all that he was worth in the world. But this was of no avail, and he was obliged to return without it. The poor old man, wringing his hands, cried bitterly for his loss. And, indeed, he then did look up to God on high, which so moved me with pity for him, that I gave him nearly one-third of my fruits. We then proceeded to the markets to sell them, and Providence was more favourable to us than we could have expected, for we sold our fruits uncommonly well. I got for mine about thirty-seven bits. Such a surprising reverse of fortune, in so short a space of time, seemed like a dream to me and proved no small encouragement for me to trust the Lord in any situation. My captain afterwards frequently used to take my part, and get me my right, when I have been plundered, or used ill by these tender Christian depredators, among whom I have shuddered to observe the unceasing blasphemous excretions, which are wantonly thrown out by persons of all ages and conditions, not only without occasion, but even as if they were indulgences in pleasure. On one of our trips to St. Cat's I had eleven bits of my own, and my friendly captain lent me five bits more, with which I bought a Bible. I was very glad to get this book, which I scarcely could meet with anywhere. I think there were none sold in Montserrat, and, much to my grief, from being forced out of the Edna in the manner I have related, my Bible and the Guide to the Indians, the two books I loved above all others, were left behind. While I was in this place, St. Kitts, a very curious imposition on human nature took place. A white man wanted to marry in the church, a free black woman that had land and slaves in Montserrat, but the clergyman told him it was against the law of the place to marry a white and a black in the church. The man then asked to be married on the water, to which the parson consented, and the two lovers went in one boat, and the parson and clerk in another and thus the ceremony was performed. After this, the loving pair came on board our vessel, and my captain treated them extremely well, and brought them safe to Montserrat. The reader cannot but judge of the irksomeness of this situation to a mind like mine. In being daily exposed to new hardships and impositions, after having seen many better days, and having been, as it were, in a state of freedom and plenty, added to which every part of the world I had hitherto been in seemed to me a paradise in comparison of the West Indies. My mind was therefore hourly replete with inventions and thoughts of being freed, and, if possible, by honest and honourable means, for I always remembered the old adage, and I trust it has ever been my ruling principle, that honesty is the best policy, and likewise that other golden precept, to do unto all men as I would they should do unto me. However, as I was from early years a predestinarian, I thought whatever fate had determined must ever come to pass, and therefore, if ever it were my lot to be freed, nothing could prevent me, although I should at present see no means or hope to obtain my freedom. On the other hand, if it were my fate to not be freed, I never should be so, and all my endeavours for that purpose would be fruitless. In the midst of these thoughts I therefore looked up with prayers anxiously to God for my liberty, and at the same time I used every honest means, and endeavoured all that was possible on my part to obtain it. In process of time I became master of a few pounds, and in a fair way of making more, which my friendly captain knew very well. This occasioned him sometimes to take liberties with me, but whenever he treated me waspishly, I used plainly to tell him my mind, and that I would die before I would be imposed on as other negroes were, and that to me life had lost its relish when liberty was gone. This I said, although I foresaw my then well-being or future hopes of freedom, humanly speaking, depended on this man. However, as he could not bear the thoughts of my not sailing with him, he always became mild on my threats. I therefore continued with him, and from my great attention to his orders and his business I gained him credit, and through his kindness to me I at last procured my liberty. While I thus went on, filled with the thoughts of freedom, 
and resisting oppression as well as I was able. My life hung daily in suspense, particularly in the serfs I have formerly mentioned, as I could not swim. These are extremely violent throughout the West Indies, and I was ever exposed to their howling rage and devouring fury in all the islands. I have seen them strike and toss a boat right up an end, and maim several on board. Once in the Granada Islands, when I and about eight others were pulling a large boat with two puncheons of water in it, a surf struck us, and drove the boat and all in it about a half stone's throw, among some trees, and above the high water mark. We were obliged to get all the assistance we could from the nearest estate to mend the boat, and launch it into the water again. At Montserrat one night, in pressing hard to get off the shore on board, the punt was overset with us four times. The first time I was very near being drowned. However, the jacket I had on kept me up above water a little space of time, while I called on a man near me who was a good swimmer, and told him I could not swim. He then made haste to me, and just as I was sinking he caught hold of me, and brought me to sounding, and then he went and brought the punt also. As soon as we had turned the water out of her, lest we should be used ill for being absent, we attempted again three times more, and as often the horrid surf served us as at first. But at last, the fifth time we attempted, we gained our point, at the imminent hazard of our lives. One day also, at Old Road in Montserrat, our captain, and three men besides myself, were going in a large canoe in quest of rum and sugar when a single surf tossed the canoe an amazing distance from the water, and some of us even a stone's throw from each other. Most of us were very much bruised, so that I and many more often said, and really thought, that there was not such another place under the heavens as this. I longed therefore much to leave it, and daily wished to see my master's promise performed of going to Philadelphia. While we lay in this place, a very cruel thing happened on board of our sloop which filled me with horror, though I found afterwards such practices were frequent. There was a very clever and decent, free young mulatto man who sailed a long time with us. He had a free woman for his wife, by whom he had a child, and she was then living on shore, and all very happy. Our captain and mate, and other people on board, and several elsewhere, even the natives of Bermudas, all knew this young man from a child, that he was always free and no one had ever claimed him as their property. However, as might too often overcomes right in these parts, it happened that a Bermuda's captain, whose vessel lay there for a few days in the road, came on board of us, and seeing the mulatto man, whose name was Joseph Clipson, he told him he was not free, and that he had orders from his master to bring him to Bermuda's. The poor man could not believe the captain to be in earnest, but he was very soon undeceived, his men laying violent hands on him, and although he showed a certificate of his being born free in St. Kitts, and most people on board knew that he served his time to boat-building, and always passed for a free man, yet he was taken forcibly out of our vessel. He then asked to be carried ashore before the secretary or magistrates, and these infernal invaders of human rights promised him he should, but instead of that, they carried him on board the other vessel, and the next day, without giving the poor man any hearing on shore, or suffering him even to see his wife or child, he was carried away, and probably doomed never more in this world to see them again. Nor was this the only instance of this kind of barbarity I was witness to. I have since often seen in Jamaica and other islands free men, whom I have known in America, thus villainously trepanned and held in bondage. I have heard of two similar practices, even in Philadelphia, and were it not for the benevolence of the Quakers in that city, many of the sable race who now breathe the air of liberty, would, I believe, be groaning indeed under some planter's chains. These things opened my mind to a new scene of horror, to which I had been before a stranger. Hitherto I had thought only slavery dreadful, but the state of a free negro now appeared to me equally so at least and in some respects even worse, for they live in constant alarm for their liberty. And even this is but nominal, for they are universally insulted and plundered, without the possibility of redress, 
for such is the equity of the West Indian laws that no free Negro's evidence will be admitted in their courts of justice. In this situation is it surprising that slaves, when mildly treated, should prefer even the misery of slavery to such a mockery of freedom? I was now completely disgusted with the West Indies, and thought I should never be entirely free until I had left them. With thoughts like these my anxious, boding mind recalled those pleasing scenes I left behind, scenes where fair liberty in bright array makes darkness bright and e'en illumines day, where nor complexion, wealth, or station can protect the wretch who makes a slave of man. I determined to make every exertion to obtain my freedom, and to return to old England. For this purpose I thought a knowledge of navigation might be of use to me, for though I did not intend to run away unless I should be ill-used, yet in such a case, if I understood navigation, I might attempt my escape in our sloop, which was one of the swiftest sailing vessels in the West Indies, and I could be at no loss for hands to join me, and if I should make this attempt, I had intended to have gone for England. But this, as I said, was only to be in the event of my meeting with any ill usage. I therefore employed the mate of my vessel to teach me navigation, for which I agreed to give him twenty-four dollars, and actually paid him part of the money down. Though when the captain, after some time, came to know that the mate was having such a sum for teaching me, he rebuked him, and said it was a shame for him to take any money from me. However, my progress in this useful art was much retarded by the constancy of our work. Had I wished to run away, I did not want opportunities, which frequently presented themselves, and particularly at one time soon after this, when we were at the island of Guadalupe, there was a large fleet of merchantmen bound for old France, and seamen then being very scarce, they gave from fifteen to twenty pounds a man for the run. Our mate, and all the white sailors, left our vessel on this account, and went on board of the French ships. They would have had me go also with them, for they regarded me, and they swore to protect me if I would go. And as the fleet was set to sail the next day, I really believe I could have got safe to Europe at that time. However, as my master was kind, I would not attempt to leave him, and remembering the old maxim that honesty is the best policy, I suffered them to go without me. Indeed, my captain was much afraid of my leaving him and the vessel at that time, as I had so fair an opportunity. But I thank God this fidelity of mine turned out much to my advantage hereafter, when I did not in the least think of it, and made me so much favor with the captain, that he used now and again to teach me some parts of navigation himself. But some of our passengers, and others, seeing this, found much fault with him for it saying it was a very dangerous thing to let a negro know navigation. Thus I was hindered again in my pursuits. About the latter end of the year, 1764, my master bought a larger sloop, called the Providence, about seventy or eighty tons, of which my captain had the command. I went with him into this vessel, and we took a load of new slaves for Georgia and Charlestown. My master now left me entirely to the captain, though he still wished for me to be with him. But I, who always much wished to lose sight of the West Indies, was not a little rejoiced at the thought of seeing any other country. Therefore, relying on the goodness of my captain, I got ready all the little venture I could, and when the vessel was ready, we sailed to my great joy. When we got to our destined places, Georgia and Charlestown, I expected I should have an opportunity of selling my little property to advantage. But here, particularly in Charlestown, I met with buyers, white men, who imposed at me, as in other places. Notwithstanding, I was resolved to have fortitude, thinking no lot or trial is too hard when kind heaven is the rewarder. We soon got loaded again, and returned to Montserrat, and there, amongst the rest of the islands, I sold my goods well. And in this manner I continued trading during the year 1764 meeting with various scenes of imposition, as usual. After this, my master fitted out his vessel for Philadelphia in the year 1765, and during the time we were loading her, and getting ready for the voyage, I worked with redoubled alacrity, from the hope of getting enough money by these voyages to buy my freedom in time, if it should please God, 
and also to see the town of Philadelphia, which I had heard a great deal about for some years past. Besides which, I had always longed to prove my master's promise the first day I came to him. In the midst of these elevated ideas, and while I was about getting my little merchandise in readiness, one Sunday my master sent for me to his house. When I came there, I found him and the captain together, and on my going in, I was struck with astonishment at his telling me he heard that I meant to run away from him when I got to Philadelphia. And therefore, he said, I must sell you again. You cost me a great deal of money, no less than forty pounds sterling, and it will not do to lose so much. You are a valuable fellow, continued he, and I can get any day for you one hundred guineas from many gentlemen in this island. And then he told me of Captain Doran's brother-in-law, a severe master, who ever wanted to buy me to make me his overseer. My captain also said he could get much more than a hundred guineas for me in Carolina. This I knew to be a fact, for the gentleman that wanted to buy me came off several times on board of us, and spoke to me to live with him, and said he would use me well. When I asked what work he would put me to, he said, as I was a sailor, he would make me a captain of one of his rice vessels. But I refused, and fearing at the same time, by a sudden turn I saw in the captain's temper, he might mean to sell me, I told the gentleman I would not live with him on any condition, and I would certainly run away with his vessel. But he said he did not fear that, as he would catch me again, and then he told me how cruelly he would serve me if I should do so. My captain, however, gave him to understand that I knew something of navigation, so he thought better of it, and to my great joy he went away. I now told my master I did not say I would run away in Philadelphia, neither did I mean it, as he did not use me ill, nor yet the captain, for if they did, I certainly would have made some attempts before now, but as I thought that if it were God's will I should ever be freed, it would be so, and on the contrary, if it was not his will it would not happen, so I hoped, if ever I were freed, whilst I was used well, it should be by honest means." but, as I could not help myself, he, could, he must do as he pleased. I could only hope and trust to the God of heaven, and at that instant my mind was big with inventions and full of schemes to escape. I then appealed to the captain whether he ever saw any signs of my making the least attempt to run away, and asked him if I did not always come on board according to the time for which he gave me liberty, and, more particularly, when all our men left us at Guadalupe, and went on board of the French fleet, and advised me to go with them, whether I might not, and that he could not have got me again. To my no small surprise and very great joy, the captain confirmed every syllable that I had said, and even more, for he said he had tried different times to see if I would make any attempt of this kind, both at St. Eustatia and in America, and he never found that I made the smallest but on the contrary I always came on board according to his orders. And he did really believe, if I ever meant to run away, that as I could never have had a better opportunity, I would have done it the night the mate and all the people left our vessel at Guadalupe. The captain then informed my master, who had been thus imposed upon by our mate, though I did not know who was my enemy, the reason the mate had for imposing this lie upon him which was, because I had acquainted the captain of the provisions the mate had given away or taken out of the vessel. This speech of the captain was like life to the dead to me, and instantly my soul glorified God, and still more so on hearing my master immediately say that I was a sensible fellow, and he never did intend to use me as a common slave, and that but for the entreaties of the captain, and his character of me, he would not have let me go from the stores about as I had done, that also, in so doing, he thought that by carrying one little thing or other to different places to sell, I might make money. That he also intended to encourage me in this, by crediting me with half a puncheon of rum, and half a hogshead of sugar, at a time, so that from being careful, I might have money enough, in some time, to purchase my freedom. And when that was the case, I might depend upon it he would let me have it for forty pounds sterling money, which was only the same price he gave for me. This sound gladdened my poor heart beyond measure, though indeed it was no more than the very idea I had formed in my mind of my master long before. And immediately I made him this reply, 
Sir, I have always had that very thought of you. Indeed I had. And that made me so diligent in serving you. He then gave me a large piece of silver coin, such as I had never seen or had before, and told me to get ready for the voyage, and he would credit me with a tierce of sugar, and another of rum. He also said that he had two amiable sisters in Philadelphia, from whom I might get some necessary things. Upon this my noble captain desired me to go aboard, and, knowing the African medal, he charged me not to say anything of this matter to anybody, and he promised that the lying mate should not go with him any more. This was a change indeed, in the same hour to feel the most exquisite pain, and in the turn of a moment the fullest joy. It caused in me such sensations as I was only able to express in my looks. My heart was so overpowered with gratitude, that I could have kissed both their feet. When I left the room, I immediately went, or rather flew, to the vessel. Which being loaded, my master, as good as his word, trusted me with a tierce of rum, and another of sugar, when we sailed, and arrived safe at the elegant town of Philadelphia. I soon sold my goods here pretty well, and in this charming place I found everything plentiful and cheap. While I was in this place, a very extraordinary occurrence befell me. I had been told one evening of a wise woman, a Mrs. Davis, who revealed secrets, foretold events, etc. I put little faith in this story at first, as I could not conceive that any mortal could foresee the future disposals of Providence, nor did I believe in any other revelation than that of the Holy Scriptures. However, I was greatly astonished at seeing this woman in a dream that night, though a person I never held before in my life. This made such an impression on me that I could not get the idea the next day out of my mind, and I then became as anxious to see her as I was before indifferent. Accordingly, in the evening after we left off working, I inquired where she lived, and being directed to her, to my inexpressible surprise, beheld the very woman in the very same dress she appeared to me to wear in the vision. She immediately told me I had dreamed of her the preceding night, related to me many things that had happened with a correctness that astonished me, and finally told me I should not be long a slave. This was the more agreeable news, as I believed it the more readily from her having so faithfully related the past incidents of my life. She said I should twice be in very great danger of my life within eighteen months, which, if I escaped, I should afterwards go on well. So, giving me her blessing, we parted. After staying here for some time until our vessel was loaded, and I had bought in my little traffic, we sailed from this agreeable spot for Montserrat, once more to encounter the raging serfs. We arrived safe at Montserrat, where we discharged our cargo, and soon after that we took slaves on board for St. Eustatia, and from thence to Georgia. I had always exerted myself and did double work, in order to make our voyages as short as possible, and from thus overworking myself while we were at Georgia, I caught a fever and egg. I was very ill for eleven days, and near dying. Eternity was now exceedingly impressed on my mind, and I feared very much that awful event. I prayed the Lord therefore to spare me, and I made a promise in my mind to God that I would be good if ever I should recover. At length, from having an eminent doctor to attend me, I was restored again to health, and soon after we got the vessel loaded and set off for Montserrat. During the passage, as I was perfectly restored and had much business of the vessel to mind, all my endeavours to keep up my integrity and perform my promise to God began to fail, and in spite of all I could do, as we drew nearer and nearer to the islands, my resolutions more and more declined, as if the very air of that country or climate seemed fatal to piety. When we were safe arrived at Montserrat, and I had got ashore, I forgot my former resolutions. Alas, how prone is the heart to leave that God it wishes to love, and how strongly do the things of this world strike the senses and captivate the soul! After our vessel was discharged, we soon got her ready, and took in, as usual, some of the poor oppressed natives of Africa, and other negroes. Then we set off again for Georgia and Charlestown. 
we arrived at Georgia, and having landed part of our cargo, proceeded to Charlestown with the remainder. While we were there, I saw the town illuminated. The guns were fired, and bonfires and other demonstrations of joy shown, on account of the repeal of the Stamp Act. Here I disposed of some goods on my own account, the white men buying them with smooth promises and fair words, giving me, however, but very indifferent payment. There was one gentleman, particularly, who bought a puncheon of rum from me, which gave me a great deal of trouble, and although I used the interest of my friendly captain, I could not obtain anything for it, for being a negro man, I could not oblige him to pay me. This vexed me much, not knowing how to act, and I lost some time in seeking after this Christian, and though, when the Sabbath came, which the negroes usually make their holiday, I was much inclined to go to public worship. I was obliged to hire some black men to help pull a boat across the water to God in quest of this gentleman. When I found him, after much entreaty, both from myself and my worthy captain, he at last paid me in dollars. Some of them, however, were copper, and of consequence no value. But he took advantage of my being a negro man, and obliged me to put up with those or none although I objected to them. Immediately after, as I was trying to pass them in the market, amongst other white men, I was abused for offering to pass bad coin, and though I showed them the man I got them from, I was within one minute of being tied up and flogged without either judge or jury. However, by the help of a good pair of heels, I ran off, and so escaped the bastinados I should have received. I got on board as fast as I could, but still continued in fear of them until we sailed, which I thanked God we did not long after, and I have never been amongst them since. We soon came to Georgia, where we were to complete our lading, and here worse fate than ever attended me, for one Sunday night, as I was with some negroes in their master's yard in the town of Savannah, it happened that their master, one Dr. Perkins, who was a very severe and cruel man, came in drunk, and, not liking to see any strange negroes in his yard, he and a ruffian of a white man he had in his service beset me in an instant, and both of them struck me with the first weapons they could get hold of. I cried out as long as I could for help and mercy, but though I gave a good account of myself, and he knew my captain, who lodged hard by him, it was to no purpose. They beat and mangled me in a shameful manner, leaving me near dead. I lost so much blood from the wounds I received that I lay quite motionless, and was so benumbed that I could not feel anything for many hours. Early in the morning they took me away to the jail. As I did not return to the ship all night, my captain, not knowing where I was, and being uneasy that I did not then make my appearance, he made inquiry after me, and having found where I was, immediately came to me. As soon as the good man saw me so cut and mangled, he could not forbear weeping. He soon got me out of jail to his lodgings, and immediately sent for the best doctors in the place, who at first declared it as their opinion that I could not recover. My captain on this went to all the lawyers in the town for their advice, but they told him they could do nothing for me, as I was a negro. He then went to Dr. Perkins, the hero who had vanquished me, and menaced him, swearing he would be revenged on him, and challenged him to fight. But cowardice is ever the companion of cruelty, and the doctor refused. However, by the skilfulness of one Dr. Brady of that place, I began at last to amend. But although I was so sore and bad with the wounds I had all over me, that I could not rest in any posture, yet I was in more pain on account of the captain's uneasiness about me than I otherwise should have been. The worthy man nursed and watched me all the hours of the night, and I was, through his attention and that of the doctor, able to get out of bed in about sixteen or eighteen days. All this time I was very much wanted on board, as I used frequently to go up and down the river for rafts and other parts of our cargo and stow them when the mate was sick or absent. In about four weeks I was able to go on duty, and in a fortnight after, having got in all our lading, our vessel set sail for Montserrat, 
and in less than three weeks we arrived there safe toward the end of the year. This ended my adventures in 1764, for I did not leave Montserrat again until the beginning of the following year. End of the first volume They ran the ship aground, and the fore part stuck fast and remained unmovable, but the hinder part was broken with the violence of the waves. Acts 27.41 Howbeit we must be cast upon a certain island, Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe God, that it shall be even as it was told to me. Acts 27, 26, 25 Now a thing was secretly brought to me, and mine ear received a little thereof, in thoughts from the visions of the night, when deep sleep falleth on men. Job 4, 12, 13 Lo, all these things worketh God oftentimes with man, to bring back his soul from the pit, to be enlightened with the light of the living. Job 33, 29, 30 End of chapter 6 and volume 1